Uh, I, I was dis had a discussion after uh, the meeting this morning with, with, with a brother about some questions in regard to some, some disputes some people have had. And, and he, he's been trying to deal with some, some uh, preachers and Bible students and teachers and so forth that, 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 like, that sort of like to fight with one another about doctrine. And he asked me, he says, well, how, do, how do you handle disputes when people get to having fights among themselves? And I thought, well, that's, that's probably a, a topic that we ought to talk about just a little bit. We have in the past. And there's an issue here in Acts chapter 15 where the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, his companion in the ministry up to this point, have a falling out. Now, Acts 15 verse 30, 36. And some days after... Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Um, but Paul thought not, good, it not, thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them in Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. So there's there, John Mark, you recall in Acts chapter 13, when, when, they, when Paul and Barnabas leave Antioch and go out, begin to go out in their apostolic journey, John Mark went with them. He got to Pamphylia, and then he turned around and went back. And Paul branded him as a quitter who, who, who you know, he, he quit. He didn't stick with it. So when Barnabas, and that's his nephew, uh, his, his uncle wants to take him with him on this journey, Paul says, I, no, I'm, that's just not good. He quit. Um, so verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So you have this tragic split between Paul and Barnabas, and it's a contention over whether or not they ought to take Mark with them. Now, if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, you'll see that at least between Paul and, and Mark, the, the issue got settled. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 11 2 Timothy 4.11, if you uh, start in verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved the present world, and has departed to Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, and Titus unto un Dalmatia. So you got, he's talking about brethren who's, who've been faithful, not faithful, some stand with him, some not. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So at the end of Paul's life, this Mark, who had been a quitter, has come back, and he takes him back. So the, the contention that, that led to Mar Barnabas and Paul being separated by the time the ministry is over with at, at 2 Timothy, that contention, the problem, the reason for the contention has been settled. But when you're in Acts 15, it hadn't been, and Mark hadn't proven himself. And at this point, the Apostle Paul says, no, I'm not going to take a guy who's quit. I'm not going to take somebody I can't depend on. I don't want to do it. And so they have this, and the contention is so sharp between them. Now, it's not a doctrinal contention. It's not this doctrine's right and that doctrine's wrong. It's an issue of whether we're going to take this brother with us. And the reason I want to take him is because I want to, I want, he, he's, he, uh, I think he's going to be good for the ministry. And Paul says, I'm not going to trust him. And so they have this dispute. And when the dispute, the argument got so sharp, then they, they, they separated so my point there is that that stuff happens, and it happens among the best of us. And what do you do when that kind of thing happens? Verse number 40, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. Now, when he says going to be recommended under the brethren by the grace of God, people say, well, see, the brethren endorse Paul. And said Paul was right. But that's not what that verse said. When you recommend somebody to the grace of God, they're recommended to Paul. You, you need to use grace in this situation. 
If you know, you know Paul's personality, he wasn't necessarily the most gracious guy in the world when it came to, he, was, he had convictions, had strong personality, and they're, they're recommending, Paul, don't let this thing spread. Deal with it, settle it, and get over with it. And it's interesting that they recommended Paul that way. In my reading of it, I would, you know, when I read that, I think, well, it could very well be that Paul was more the, the problem character in the thing than Barnabas was. And Barnabas was more of a, of a peacemaker uh, all through his, his ministry. And Paul was more of a, of a stern guy. And when they recommend Paul to the grace of God, and that's what, that's where the recommendation is. Deal with it in God's grace. So when you have, have disputes, what do you do? Well, I learned years ago, and I was sharing this at the, at the men's meeting, at the school meeting. One of the things that, that, that early on in my ministry I had recommended to me, and, and I did, is I sat down, one, one of the brothers, Brother Reynolds, he, he said, Ricky, you need to sit down and determine ahead of time what you're going to do when certain things happen. Because when they happen, then you, you don't need to go run and figure out. Decide ahead of time. And I, I, I read, I wrote down five or six things in the flyleaf of my Bible, and all these years I've kept them there. One of the things I did was I sat down and I said, what are you going to do when, when arguments come, when disputes come? And I took this passage and thought about it, and I wrote down four things when a dispute happens. And, and throughout through the ministry, we've been we've been in in arguments and disputes, and con, uh, I don't say fights, but been in a few of them, but not personality kind of things. Fortunately, we've we've been able to avoid the personality kind of disputes and fights on the main main. And the reason is, frankly, if you know how to deal with them then you can deal with them the way the Scripture says to deal with them. If in the moment, you get caught up in the emotion. But when you back off and you think about it just, just objectively, there are several things you can do. Number one, leave room for opposite, for, for opposite opinions. Leave, leave room for legitimate opposite viewpoints from yours. You know, a lot of times, you know the passage in Romans 14 about the weaker brother... The idea he doesn't know all the things you know, you know better than he does about something. You're the adult, he's the weaker brother. And when you read Romans 14, the best way to read that is re consider everybody to be the weaker brother. <laughs> everybody to be the one that needs you to minister to them, be considered of them. And there is a legitimate reason. There's a, the, you, you need to understand there is, is room for other people to have other opinions than yours. You're not always right about everything. Now, we're not talking about doctrinal things, but even in doctrinal things, there's, a, there's always room to grow and learn. Philippians chapter number 2. If you're, if you're careful to leave room for opposing legitimate viewpoints, you, you can... You cannot start fights when, the, when it's not necessary. You cannot start disputes when, when they aren't necessary. Philippians chapter number 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Looking not, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So if you'll put the things of others ahead of yours and not think everybody has to agree with me about every little thing, there are some opportunities for you to learn some things from other people that you don't know yet. So if you leave room for legitimate differences of opinion, you say, what are you talking about? Well, in life, you know, Mike just said, go blue. Well, my wife's sitting over there, and she, she gives you the evil eye when you say that because she's roll tide. Well, you know, you roll tide, go blue, what does that mean? A lot of folks listening on the Internet, a bunch of you folks sitting there got no idea what they're talking about. They're talking about college football. Well, big deal. Well, to Mike, it's a big deal. To my wife, it's a big deal, I can guarantee you. But, you know, you guys won last year, didn't you? Sure did. You guys won the year before that, and 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 the year before that. So, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So you, you go you go back and forth. Well, but that's an that's an arena that's okay to have some difference of opinion. The reason it's fun to win is because it's fun to have differences of opinion in it. So it's okay. So you can leave other you can leave some room for things like that. Doctrinally, there we had some questions recently. Uh, uh, there were some folks on the, on the internet that have come into right division just in the last couple, few years, and they were shocked to hear about there are people that believe the Acts 13 position. Now, maybe most of you might not even know what that is because we don't talk about that, that, that kind of thing because we hold the Acts 9 position. That is, we believe the body of Christ began with the, the salvation and commissioning of the Apostle Paul. There are, there are mid-Acts dispensationalists that put it in Acts 13. There are some that put it in Acts 11. It doesn't really matter that much doctrinally in those things, and there's always been a good-natured kind of contention about those things. Everybody I know that holds the Acts 9 position holds it firmly. Everybody I've ever met that held the Acts 13 position held it firmly. And they believe what they believe, but then they leave room for other people to believe the other things. Otherwise, you'd be, you know, be scalping everybody you know for no reason. So you leave, a li- you leave some room for some things where there's some controversy. I discussed some things just recently about Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. If God created the heaven and the earth, God's light and in him is no darkness. Why is there darkness in verse number 2? Because obviously something happened between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis 1. That's where the fall of Satan took place. Now, I say that, and there are some folks that don't want to believe that, that are absolutely intense that, the, that there was no difference, that verse 2 is the way that God created everything. And the reason they believe that is because they want, they, they want, they maintain vigorously that God created everything 6,000 years ago in six days. And they're opposing evolution. Well, I oppose evolution too, but also understand that some things happen between those two verses. They don't want to believe it. Some of my good friends, people that fill this pulpit, don't, don't believe that. I believe one thing, they believe another. We all believe that Satan fell. We all believe that creation and creation, no evolution. But we come, we have some differences of opinion. So, okay. It's okay to have those differences of opinion. Now, when I teach about that, I teach it with the conviction that I have about it. They do the same. Instead of fighting about it, we just say, okay, now we've got some difference of opinion. And you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you'll, you'll see the Lord tell you that I'm right. They'll tell me the same thing, and we'll wait till then. But instead of fighting about it, you, you leave some, some room about those kind of things. I mentioned this morning about the three pivot points in the book of Acts. Acts 2, outpouring out of the Spirit. Acts 7, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And Acts 9, the outgoing to the Gentiles. There are people, mid-Acts dispensation, that don't believe in Act, that Acts 7, that, that, uh, that, that Israel blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They said the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They go back to Mark and, and Matthew and said the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is saying that Jesus had a, had, had a demon and that that's all the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can be and that what happened in Acts, Acts 7 is not the blasphemy. And they, they, they lawyerly go through the things and lay, lay it down and they say, so it's not the blasphemy. And I look at that and I say, that doesn't make any sense to me. In the earthly ministry of Christ, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was to say Jesus had, a, had, a demon, had, a, had an evil spirit. But that's not the only thing, the blasphemy of the Holy That's not the only way you speak against the Holy Spirit. What about when, 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 when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2? In the earthly ministry of Christ, that's when he was here. But how about when he's gone and the only the Holy Spirit here? Who do you think the people in Acts 7 were fighting against? They're fighting against the Holy Spirit working in the apostles. In fact, Stephen there was filled with the Holy Spirit. So... I say, well, it makes more sense to me. Paul said he was a blasphemer. He talks about the people blaspheming, Acts 13, these people. So I say, well, no, that's, that's, uh, you know. so now we've got two different opinions. So what are you going to do? Are you going to fight and shoot each other? Or are you going to say, well, you've got a point, he's got a point, evaluate it. So you leave some room, my point is, for even doctrinal differences, but especially personal differences. Now, number two, if there's going to be an argument and you've got to fight about it, don't assassinate people. And I can't tell you that, I can't say that, 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 that strongly enough. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3, when you deal with people that you disagree with, you don't have to be an assassin. 
it's never right to kill people, whether physically or figuratively. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29. Let not corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it, may, that it may, might minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Listen, if you don't get, if there's got to be an argument, you don't have to be unkind. You don't have to be cruel. If you look at a verse, 2, Timothy, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, for me personally, this has been a verse that I took as a motto in my life about these particular issues. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 24 not for that we have dominion over your faith, but we're helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. When I stand in this pulpit, when I teach in, in the classroom, when I'm dealing with people individually, when I'm on the road, anywhere, my whole thinking process is I don't have dominion over your faith. I don't want to have dominion over you in any way. When you're trying to win an argument, what you're trying to do is have dominion over people. So if there's going to be an argument... Don't try to have dominion. Don't try to be the boss. Try to be a helper of their joy. Try, look at it like, here's, here's, let me help you. Let me bring you to the place where you can see the joy in the real answer. Because by faith, that's the only way they're going to stand. So if there's going to be an argument, don't try to assassinate people. Try to be helpers of their joy. Get over trying to, I just got to be right because I'm right and having dominion. Now, if you don't get your way, and if you fight, you probably won't if they fight with anybody who's got any backbone. If you don't get your way, best thing to do is just get over it. <laughs> because you're not going to always win. You're not always going to be right. And when you get over it, then you can get on with life. Philippians chapter 3. You know, one of the hardest, one of the, one of the saddest things that's in the world to me is watch people mope around about losing a battle. Philippians chapter 3. Brethren, I count, verse 13. Philippians three thirteen, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you don't get your way, just get over it and get on with life. There's a, there, there's, there's, there's a work to do. Press toward the mark. Get on with it. I was discussing some things back in last month when, when we had the school meeting and the brethren from around the country were here. And several guys were talking to me about how do you reach people that don't want to understand right division? How do you reach people that, 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 that won't listen about the Bible issue? How do you and I said, you know, after you beat somebody in the head, you beat your head against the wall with it over and over and over and over again, why don't you get over it? It's on them. They don't want to hear. So instead of just still just trying, just look two doors down. There will be lost people all around you out there. Oscar Woodall used to say, if you'll ask 10 people the crunch questions, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? If you don't know, would you like to know? If, you, if I could show you out of God's word how you can know for sure, you, you, you have all your sins forgiven in heaven and as your home when you die, would you like to know? Can I show it to you? You ask 10 people that, six of them will say, yes, I'd like to know. And if you share the gospel with six people, two or three of them, will, you know what they'll do? They'll get saved. If you reach somebody with the gospel... And then you want to start teaching them. You know what they'll do? They'll say, teach me. Because you've already got, you've got an open door now. 
and that person that you've won to Christ, you've shared the gospel with them, they've seen the truth out of God's Word, they'll come to you for more light. You know how I know that? I've been doing it for a while. I've seen it happen over and over and over. Where do you think a ministry like this comes from? It's because people see truth, and then they, they understand where they got it, and they come from more. We just, I was just telling me today about, just a few minutes ago, about, about a family that comes from, I don't know, maybe 100 miles away, and they come about, and they, they, they come, and the guy says to Alex, said, I got, we've got to come more because we're learning. We had a, had a funeral here back in January, and it was a three-hour funeral spectacular, and a really weird kind of thing. The brother and his wife, the brother that died, his wife, they, um, they watched on the Internet, but it's got all kind of different kind of people in the family, and we, we, you know, we, we did what we did. And they called this past week, one of the, one of the guys calls and says, you know, that funeral turned my whole life around. I heard some truth out of God's Word that changed my life and my whole thinking process. And I want to be a part of what you guys are doing. And when you have that kind of influence on people, they'll come and listen to you. If you're fighting to try to get something done and it isn't working, listen, when you don't get your way, look, get over it and get on with life. Get on with, when I say get on with life, I don't mean forget. I mean, go out and find somebody. To get them. If you get somebody saved, share the gospel with them, they'll let you teach them. And if you're reaching with people and they won't hear it, they won't hear it, they won't hear it, they put up the, 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 the barrier, instead of beating your head against the wall till you're silly, understand, hey, there's some, there's some other people to talk to out there. And get on with that. So if you don't, if you don't get your way, don't get mad. Don't assassinate somebody. Don't try to j just have dominion over them. Just say, okay, right now you're not open, but there are other people that are. And you get on, get on with life. And then sometimes, there in Acts 15, sometimes, frankly, the best solution is just to be separate from people. He says there in chapter 15, Verse 39, the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. They made the choice, we can't work together. They made an honest decision based on an honest difference of opinion, and they, they separated. There's every time, everything you can't resolve. We take stands here for truth. We take stand for the gospel. We say we, we, we represent a gospel that you can believe. When people come along and, uh, with, with, with a works program, people that don't appreciate the clarity of the gospel, people want to add, add works uh, to the gospel, they want to come along and say you need to repent of your sin, you need to get baptized, you need to come to church, you need to do all these kinds. When people do that, we oppose that. And you know what happens? When, when you stand for the clarity of the gospel, there comes a point where you can't work with people that don't. It's a legitimate difference. And instead of trying to beat your head, beat it, beat it, there comes a point where you say, wait a minute, I can't be a part of that. We stand for a Bible, you can believe. Listen, the King James Bible issue is, is, a, is a fertile issue for contention. I know that. I've been through that battle for, for decades. And yet, there comes a point where you, there are people you can work with. I talked to a brother just two weeks ago, and uh, he said, well, I, he's, he's I told him he's abandoned the King James Bible because he no longer believes it's his final authority. But he said to me, I didn't abandon it. I'm still, it's the only Bible I use. I said, but it's not the one you believe. Because you, when it disagrees with what you want it to say, you change it. Well, that's an issue that become, becomes a, an issue. If you don't have a Bible, how can we discuss things? So sometimes it comes to the place where if you, don't, if you don't have a Bible and you don't have a Bible you can trust and you don't know what that Bible is, then how do we have a legitimate discussion and work together? And there comes a point where there is a legitimate reason to separate. I've worked with people that, that don't hold my view about the King James Bible for decades. But when it became a problem that my view was a problem, then it's time I hit the road. Because I'm not going to say... My, I'm not going to say I have a Bible that's got mistakes in it because I don't believe the Bible has mistakes in it. And if you're satisfied to say that, I'm not. And if me not being satisfied to say it is a problem for you, then you and I can't work together in that level. 
Well, that's, that's a legitimate reason to depart. The grace life. Someone, I, I heard, heard a, a grace preacher recently talking about you need to make Jesus number first in your life. You need to put him first in your life. And you hear this all the time. You need to be dedicated to Jesus. You need to make him first in your life. And every time I hear that, I think, what? He already is. <laughs> he made himself Lord. The verse we were looking at in Romans this morning, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He, he, he is the Lord. He's first whether you, whether you recognize it or not. You don't make him something he already is. Now, you can recognize who he is and live in light of it, but you ain't making him first. You couldn't do that anyway. Well, when he is first, the grace life, God's already given you. You're trying to work to get things God's already given you. That's total frustration. And listen, what I've learned about that is that if that's the way your ministry is going, you're going you're gonna to undermine the ministry that I have. And that doesn't work so well. So you say, well, what do you do? Well, you go that way, and I'll go this way. I had a friend years ago. <laughs> he's pastoring a church, and they had a contention about some of these things. And he got the fellows together. He says, now those of you that believe this, here, there's half the hymnals. Y'all go that way. I'm going to take the other half the hymnals. I'm going to go this way. Because the contention was such that they needed to be... So there's, there is a point when a legitimate separation needs to happen. So sometimes the best solution is separating. An honest difference, an honest parting. But when you do, listen, make it legitimate. Leave room for a legitimate opinion. When, when, it, when you can't have that agreement, you don't have to assassinate one another. You can go... And you can not try to have dominion over someone, but you'll be a helper of their joy, for by faith they stand. And if what they're... Have you ever heard sin defined as missing the mark? That's the, that's the classic definition, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin there, the idea is you've missed the mark. And I used to think, that's a weak definition of sin. <laughs> If you've read Romans chapter 1, yeah. you know, you, you read all the things that sin is, and you say, well, that's sin. Well, what does he mean? When he says missing the mark, all those things that he describes as the sinful activities, you know what that is? That's missing God's mark for your life. What sin is, is you're missing what God has for you. God has a plan. God has something for every. He, he wants to get everybody saved, put them in Christ, and be a, have the, the good works that God before then that we walk in function in your life. What sin is you missing that? And it can turn into some terrible, evil things. Romans 1 tells you about them. Galatians 5 tells you about them. Colossians 3 tells you about them. And all those things, as gross as they are, are really just simply missing God's best. That he has planned for you in Christ in your life. If you're lost, you don't have them. If you're a believer, you're missing those things. So I'm not content with missing those things. And if being a part of, of someone's fellowship and part of some ministry and part of, means I'm going to miss those things, I don't want that. So there's a legitimate reason. There can be a legitimate reason to depart. But when you do, listen. You don't have to assassinate people because you're looking to be a helper of their joy. Because the only way they're going to recover themselves is, to, is by faith to stand in the truth of God's word. So when, when, a, when a contention comes up, if you just start, I'm going to leave some room for legitimate opposite viewpoints. And if there's going to be an argument... I'm not going to assassinate people. I'm not going to try to have dominion over people. I'm going to try to be a helper of their joy. And if I don't get that accomplished, if I don't have the opportunity to do that, if my viewpoint doesn't, doesn't prevail, then I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to get on with life. And sometimes when, when the best solution is to separate, then I'll do that. But I'll do it not with a, a mad, angry spirit. I'll do it with a, the Lord bless you, and I'm going to go do the work of the ministry. 
And by the way, a fellow told me one time, he says, you know, if you leave a place and you go out in the parking lot and you throw rocks back at it, you didn't leave. And that's where a lot of people leave. They don't really leave. They go out in the parking lot and just keep throwing rocks back. Well, if you're going to do that, you didn't leave. And you didn't, you, 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 the, the, uh, the, the issue there is you're still trying to win. You're not trying to be a helper of their joy. So when a dispute comes, I work down through those, those issues because I've learned that when a dispute comes, I need to find out, is this legitimate? Is it really, you know, a different viewpoint? And is it a legitimate viewpoint that, that can be different and, and I can let people have, have some room to be different, a weaker brother and so forth? Do we really have to argue? And if we do, if there's something that needs to be dealt with, I don't have to assassinate them. I can be a helper of their joy. And if I don't get my way, listen, it's not the end of, it's not the end of my life and my ministry because I can get on with pressing toward the mark. And sometimes I do need to recognize that there needs to be a legitimate separation. So when you work your way down through those things, most of the time we get caught in that second and third one. And we never come to that last one. Because once you recognize there is a legitimate reason to separate, then you have to count the cost and do it. And like I said, when you, when you do it, you don't go out in the parking lot and lob rocks back. You go out, leave the parking lot, get on the road and get on with life and ministry. So, remember Paul and Barnabas. They, they separated. They did separate. That's the last year of Barnabas. But you do hear about Mark coming back. So, it isn't the end. But you, you handle it in a way that it commends you to the grace of God. That's what, the, that's what they did with Paul. Obviously, at least in my thinking, as I look at it, Paul was the one that needed <laughs> to have grace commended to him, to be patient with people. And that's why Paul could say what he does, not for that I have dominion over your faith, but I'm a helper together for your joy, for by faith you stand. You can agree with me all you want to, but it's your faith resting in the truth of God's word to you that gives you the faith, the, the strength to stand in your life, not your faith in me, not your faith in a church, in a, in a denomination, in a religious system, but your faith in the truth of who God's made you in Christ. That's what gives you the capacity to stand lacking nothing. That's what sufficiency is. So, oh, let a word to the wise be, be good. And uh, that's my counsel on Mother's Day. My wife told me don't tell a bunch of Mother's Day jokes, so I didn't. I tried to behave. Okay, I'm looking at her. She's, she's smiling at me, so I'm okay. All right? All right. Sam? <laughs> I think it's really good what you said. Um, what about if you, if you completely avoid a confrontation? Like when I was <laughs> with somebody and a woman passed the, I mean, quoting Matthew 25, he's a really, you know, telling me other versions were good, and I just avoided it. <laughs> 